I like to think that I'm making a difference. Anybody I know that that does this is committed. I mean, they 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 really enjoy it, and they don't view it as drudgery or routine or just another this or just another that. There's a great variety of areas of the body we work in, and there's a whole host of different type of techniques we use in order to try to get a good result. I'm going to grab a coat here. Dr. Wilk's surgical specialty is the reconstruction of ears. He's recognized across Canada for successful results. How are you? Good. So how old are you, Jacob? Nine. Okay. Jacob was born with a very underdeveloped external ear. He doesn't have a canal, he doesn't have an eardrum. So basically what we did is we took portions of uh, three of his ribs and made a framework and placed it underneath the skin to try to make it shaped like an ear. Over the next couple of months. So we're going to take out some of these stitches, all right? And the plan now would be to wait six months and then bring him back and to elevate the ear from the side of his head to give it a little bit more of a three-dimensional look. Dr. Wilkes is one of a handful of surgeons worldwide who fashions new ears out of rib cartilage instead of plastic. Small amounts of cartilage connecting four of the ribs to the breastbone are removed. It works very, very well. From a functional point of view, it doesn't do anything to the hearing, but patients are very happy with the, uh, with the results. Howdy. How are you? Amy Gilbertson was born with a deformed right ear and no ear canal. She's preparing to undergo two surgeries, six months apart, for the reconstruction of a new ear. Basically, the first operation involves taking ribs from the same side. We take portions of usually three or four ribs, and we make a framework. The reconstructive surgery requires extensive preparation to create the final template Dr. Wilkes will use in the OR. A cast of Amy's normal ear is taken to make a 3D model, which is then scanned to create the template. What we've got here is a uh, digital image of her normal ear. I'm going to make a little template. Using the template as a guide, Dr. Wilkes will carve the cartilage in the shape of an ear. It takes a while to carve the framework because you're taking pieces of three or four different ribs and then wiring them together to make a framework. Six months later, after the new tissues have settled, Dr. Wilkes will surgically lift them to give the ear a three-dimensional appearance. A lot of people just don't understand what it's like. To, to have something like this. That, uh, because they're so used to having two ears and not having to think consciously about what they look like all the time. Or, you know, walk out on a windy day and maybe have somebody take a look at it and have a bad reaction to it or anything like that. So. Whether you've lost part of your anatomy uh, from cancer or an accident or whatever, suddenly uh, you don't fit in quite the same and people look at you different. And so for, for a lot of these patients, the emotional turmoil far outweighs the physical problem that they have. The whole reason surgeons become surgeons is to be in the operating room and to do things there, and that's where they're most comfortable. That's where they get their enjoyment. Ever since I was little, I always wanted to be a doctor. All set? Okay. Once I realized I couldn't be a hockey player, <laughs> well, that's really when I decided that I would like to do surgery. Well, I've been exposed to a lot of things that the normal person in their day-to-day -day life isn't exposed to, and I realized pretty quickly that it's a lot easier to be on the doctor side of the treatment or the scalpel. Yeah. As Dr. Wilkes marks Amy's ear, his senior resident, Dr. Diane Wong, begins the retrieval of the rib cartilage needed for the reconstruction. Positioning is important, so it takes a while to decide where you're going to make your cuts and how you're going to shift things around in order to get the ear in the right position. So what's going to happen is this is the part of the ear that we're going to use. Once we get underneath take this out, we're going to lift the skin up to this marking here, because you need some extra skin in order for it to go over the edges of your, our framework. Dr. Wilkes has to remove some of the original tissue before he can implant the new cartilage. So now what we've got to do is we've got to take all this stuff out of here, which will be a little tricky because there's so many nooks and crannies. And you don't know which of the skin you're going to use until the end, so we, we want to preserve it all. So then I'll have just an empty skin bag, mm -hmm. which is what I want. But it's a bit fiddly to do this. In the meantime, Dr. Wong has opened the chest and Dr. Wilkes begins to remove the rib sections. 
Have, have we got a bone cutter? Although cartilage is softer than bone and usually easier to remove, in this case, Dr. Wilkes needs a bone cutter to get it out. We remove the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth ribs, or portions thereof. Long term, it really doesn't have much effect other than the fact that they may have a little bit of flattening of the contour of their chest. See, that's great length there, Dan. Initially, there's discomfort because it's like having several broken ribs. Extra cartilage needed for the second surgery is also removed. It is stored inside Amy's chest, under skin and muscle tissue, for easy retrieval through the same incision six months later. We're making the pocket. We've got to flip things around a bit like a jigsaw puzzle here. So I've got to free them up enough, but I have to leave some tissue attached so there's blood supply. Okay, so that's the rib cartilage. And what we're going to do is carve it and try to make it look something like that. Cartilage is a really nice material to use for reconstruction. The important thing is we keep it moist, because if it dries out, then you'll have problems. Is this the smallest blade? Oh, here it is. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, perfect. There is a lot of creativity needed for certain types of procedures that we do. Great stuff to work with. Yeah, it's really good. This is going to be the rim. This is going to sit on top. And uh, it's going to be like this. This is stiffer there, too. Surgeons think pretty carefully about what they're going to do to people. There's a trust in all surgery, if you think about it, with um, you know meeting a surgeon for a short period of time and then having a stranger put you to sleep and then another stranger cut you up. There's not many things where you would give someone that much trust that quickly after meeting them. You know, we try very hard not to, to violate that trust. These are the wires, sutures we use to wire the pieces together. I'm just gonna make sure these two pieces of rib stay together. We've just about got the framework done. The only problems we've had is there's some areas of calcification, which are areas that are fragile and don't bend. So it makes this part here a wee bit straighter. And we got a crack there. But overall, it's done quite well. After four hours of carving and shaping, Dr. Wilkes has finished the framework for the new ear. Things have come together pretty well. I think she'll end up with good results. So I'll just put that away. And you want to grab that light? And we'll just push yours over here a little bit. So we'll test it in there and see if it, how she fits. Well, I'm looking for it to fit and things to sort of fit in the right spots. Do that, please. So we've got all this extra little pieces here. We're going to um, cut off some redundant skin. But you can see when we seal it off, all of a sudden the ear starts to appear from the depths. She'll be in hospital probably about five days. Then she'll wait for about six months before we would do the second stage. But, uh, you know, she won't get a good idea of it until we take these things off in seven to 10 days. And even then it'll be swollen and it gradually continues to improve until we get to the next stage. All in all, it's gone well. Hi, you're right there, just on the freeway. It's not easy when one of the parents is a physician. Certainly in my situation, I'm very fortunate that I have a family that I do. They uh, understand uh, the work that I do. I enjoy doing things with my children. I enjoy watching their sporting activities. I think you find when those things are really important, you can get to more of them than you really think you can. We got phys ed tomorrow. Dr. Wilkes and his wife, Audrey, have three children. It's quite easy to use your career as an excuse to not do some of the things that maybe you should. It's in good shape. Yeah, it looks well fed, eh? When's deer season? Pretty soon? Must be any time. Well, he's Martin's up. You get a little smarter when you get older. OK, here we go. And realize that you need to do some other things in your life. 
In addition to his surgical practice, Dr. Wilkes runs a unique clinic in Edmonton that caters solely to patients requiring head or face prosthetics. We have many patients who have had fairly aggressive treatment to try to cure cancer, for example. Although the treatment may increase the quantity of their life, often it can decrease the quality of their life. As the plastic surgeon for the clinic, Dr. Wilkes does all the reconstruction procedures, as well as implanting anchors that hold the prosthetic in place. Patients do surprisingly well with these prosthetics, and uh, in the right kind of case, it's an excellent treatment option. We did this one in February or March, and this one in June. Oh, okay. So have you got your prosthesis on now? Uh, yes. Angie Brochu was badly injured in a fire and suffered severe burns to her ears. Dr. Wilkes determined that for her, a prosthesis was the best solution. Historically, the use of prosthetics to reconstruct people was not very successful. One of the biggest problems was keeping it in place. Just take it off now, Sean. Has it ever fallen off? Nope. Dr. Wilkes was the first plastic surgeon in Canada to pioneer the use of titanium implants to anchor prosthetics into place. There's certain properties of titanium so that you can't unscrew it. You have to cut the bone. It, it bonds that well. We use it to hold nasal prosthetics or ears or eyes. What do you require for this patient then? OK, so if you could make uh, our, our standard. As co-director of the clinic, Dr. Wilkes oversees a team of medical experts who create state-of-the-art ear and eye prosthetics. When we see a patient with some sort of major facial deformity, we see them as a team. The team will then make a facial prosthesis based on copying parts of the normal anatomy with various computer simulations, making models. This is all in wax, so we're just doing a little modifications in this stage before we actually make a mold. They'll make the prosthesis, they'll color it. And then I'll lay in blood vessels and some of the freckles that you may find in his skin. And then the next step with putting in eyelashes and putting in the actual ocular prosthesis. Uh, we do the surgery to put in the implants and then ultimately the prosthesis and the implants join and then we hopefully have a satisfied patient. And Dr. Wilkes normal. Clinic Compru is internationally respected and plastic uh, surgeons from around the world the visit regularly to study the team's successful techniques. Why do you call it Compru? Well, it's either that or craniofacial osseointegration maxillofacial prosthetic rehabilitation unit. So what would you call it? <laughs> Never has slipped out Never, at any no. inopportune time no. or anything? It's been really good. Good. After I got the prosthesis, it was, um, you know, where you're not afraid to look in the mirror, to be out in the public. So it's like another fresh start. So how are things going? Good. Good. Six weeks after her operation, Amy has returned so for a follow-up visit with Dr. Wilkes. And so this is getting better. The swelling's going down. Yeah, it's changed quite a bit. Yeah, the scars will continue to fade. So at this point, are you glad you did it? Yes. Yeah. So we'll just get some pictures today. Sure. So we'll plan to see you in about three months, and then we can set up a tentative date for the next stage. Sounds and, really good. Yeah. I'm having a really strange time getting used to the size of it because it was so small before. It's changing all the time. It's really neat. I'm glad I had it done. So, Whereabouts? 37-year-old Juanita Holm was born without a left ear or ear canal. Like Amy, she has had the first stage surgery and is now ready to undergo the final procedure. The operation which we did uh, seven or eight months ago was to reconstruct the appearance of an external ear. So tomorrow, we're going to lift the ear out to give it more three-dimensional look. What we'll do then is we take some cartilage to put underneath here to act as a sort of a wedge, and then we, we do some operations up here above the ear to bring some tissue down to cover it. There's no um, rib incisions today, tomorrow, right? We make the incision, but the rib that we took out, we've, we've put just underneath the skin. So unless it's sort of reabsorbed or something, we just take it out so you won't have much pain. So that's the plan. Rather than opting for a prosthetic ear, Juanita chose to have Dr. Wilkes make it from her own tissue. He told me, no, I didn't have to have that. I was a candidate for my own skin and my own graft. So went ahead with it. Yeah, I'm glad it's done. I'll be even more glad when tomorrow's over. <laughs>
Today, Juanita Holm is undergoing the second and final stage of her left ear reconstruction. Well, here comes Dr. Wood. Come on. Are you warm enough? You made it. Good. Any questions? No? All right. Got my roller coaster right in. Right in. Good. Okay. Right. Hey. No, it shouldn't be too long. Okay. Very good. And originally, when I went into medical school, I thought I'd like to be a pediatrician. But I did surgery and pediatrics back to back and found out that if I had to be up all night, I much preferred to be in the operating room. Today, we're going to do uh, the second stage procedure on this lady who has what's known as microtia, where she had a uh, very underdeveloped ear. We did the first stage about uh, eight months ago, took some rib cartilage and made a framework and put it in. And now we're going to try to give the ear a little bit more of a three dimensional look. First, we're just going to make our markings to decide where we want to make our incisions. As Dr. Wilkes maps out the area around Juanita's left ear, his assistant, Dr. Letting, retrieves the cartilage that was stored in her chest during the first procedure. There we go. Good. Okay, another skin hook. When we took the cartilage, we put this piece just in the fatty tissue. When we did this before, the biggest complaint she had was the pain in the chest and how long it took to settle down. So that when we lift this up, we can put the cartilage underneath to hold it out. Okay, scalpel, please. We're just going to free up the ear and bring it away from the side of the head. Okay, scalpel again, please. Is there a chance you need more? No, I think you can close it. Yep. So we want it to sit up. Something like that. There's hair here. So we're just gonna take some of the follicles out of here. The hairline in these patients is a little different than normal if they had an ear. And because of where we put the ear, sometimes there's a little bit of hair bearing skin over top of it. And some of them, there's quite a bit, and then it becomes a much bigger challenge. This is just a nuisance. But in some patients, it's a major problem. Perpetual problem. Losing hair in places you want it and getting hair in places you don't want it. In the operating room, that's where the action is. That's where you can really concentrate on what you're doing. You're sort of oblivious to what's going on in the rest of the world. That's where the challenge is, and that's where the fun is. When you lift this up, you've got a big raw spot in the back. So you've got to get the raw spot covered with tissue, and you've got to get tissue to cover this piece of cartilage. So one of the things we're doing is freeing up. Again, we're sort of boring from Peter to pay Paul. So a lot of what we do in plastic surgery is we're sort of stealing from one spot and shifting it to another. Yeah, I'll hold this one. With the skin flaps ready for the implant, Dr. Wilkes carves the cartilage into shape. Have, uh, With this second stage is not too, too much sculpting. My son, who's a very avid golfer at age 12, someone asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up, and he told me they wanted to be a doctor and work at a golf course. <laughs> I told them that there's lots of doctors that are at golf courses, but I don't know too many that work at the club. We've taken the cartilage and we've carved it into a piece like this that sits underneath to hold this up. So when we put this up here, then it makes the ear sit where it's supposed to. Now we're just sewing this flap into position. So it'll cover the, the cartilage graft because it needs to have blood supply over top of it, otherwise it'll just die and melt away. Well, people, surprisingly enough, become quite attached to what they call their little ear. They don't want you to cut off their little ear. They want you to work with what they have. Yeah. Mm. It's just, you know, the way they view themselves. See, this drapes in there very nicely. Mm. There's no tension on it. Mm -hmm. It's gone well. And basically, we're just going to sew it up. I'm pretty confident it's going to look better than what she had. Our hope is her ear would be something she's pleased with, and she can carry on and worry about other things. going good so how many weeks are we now uh, a month a month and a bit, month and a bit. okay any problems with healing no nope. starting to get some hair growing back that's good yeah. great
Yeah, it's got really nice, uh, nice contour. Any pain now, or is it? Uh... A little bit every now and again. Yeah. But not a lot. Yeah. All these pink pinkness from all the scars here, that'll all fade. Okay. It's just going to take several months to do that, and your hair will grow back in and cover it well. But it's looking good. For lack of a better word, kind of feel put together. Like more, I hate to use the word complete, but that's <laughs> that about describes it. That's all. And I mean, I've wanted it done for a long time. Like everything that should be there is there. And even though there's no hearing out of it, it's still, you know, to look, you don't know anything's wrong. So, and that's what I wanted. As long as it works, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. I'll buy the phone. If the patients leave with a smile on their face, I think we've had some success. If I look at what I do now compared with what I was trained to do 20 years ago, probably half of what I do now is something that's new or different from what I trained. So it's, it's not like you train and you practice for 30 years and everything stays the same. There's a constant evolution. One of the things about plastic surgery is the fact that you're able to see quite quickly how successful you've been. So I think that's quite gratifying to see the effects that you make on people's lives. You know, half the fun's the journey.